Welcome to Military Analytics. Have you ever thought about how many people on the territory of Ukraine do not believe in this war and do not want to be in the Russian army? In fact, when we consider the war policies implemented by Russian leader Vladimir Putin in Ukraine, it's not difficult to estimate that the number of people who do not want to take part in this war has reached very serious levels. The most important factor in the failure of anti-war Russian soldiers and Russian citizens possibly sent to the Ukrainian front lines to obey Putin's orders is Russia's inability to provide humanitarian conditions for its soldiers and citizens who join the volunteer army. For this reason, the Russians on the Ukrainian front lines do not want to face the restrictive problems such as infectious diseases, hunger and thirst in Ukraine. The Ukrainian forces, on the other hand, have a very striking project that will go down in world history. The name of this project is I Want to Live. This incredible project, which offers a new hope of life for Russians, has become very popular among Russian soldiers and citizens, especially in recent days. Ukrainian officials reported that a website called I Want to Live, created for Russian soldiers who wanted to surrender, had attracted a total of more than 15 million visitors in the last seven months. The I Want to Live hotline receives an average of 80 calls a day from people who don't want to die for the Russian regime in Russia or the occupied territory of Ukraine and want to surrender. In addition, according to the latest reports of Ukrainian officials involved in this surrender line project, approximately 3,200 Russian soldiers have surrendered to the Ukrainian armed forces since last month. Vitaly Matvienko, head of the Ukraine hotline, announced recently that more than 16,000 Russian applicants have surrendered to the Ukrainian armed forces through the project since the start of September. On the other hand, the Ukrainian official added that the number of Russian applications increased by 10% from March to April. These numbers are described as high enough to thwart leader Vladimir Putin's plans to invade Ukraine. Also in it wheat recently, the Ukrainian defense ministry used the surrender project as a mockery against the Kremlin. In this tweet, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry emphasized that the closer the counterattack, the hotter the surrender season. The continuation of the tweet was as follows. Don't wait for the heat. There are currently the most favorable conditions for surrender. These striking statements had the effect of an earthquake in Moscow. In addition, such a protest destroyed the trust of Russian citizens in the Moscow administration. Therefore, the number of Russian citizens who wanted to surrender was normally increasing day by day. Vitaly Matvienko, spokesperson for the I Want to Live hotline, stated that in the last six months they received a total of 12,000 questions from the Russians about surrender. In addition, Matvienko added that the calls to ask questions about surrender came mainly from Moscow and Leningrad regions, as well as Chelyabinsk, Novgorod, and occupied Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea. Matt Vienko noted that the I Want to Live team sometimes found themselves on the phone saying words of consolation to Russians who burst into tears. In fact, we know very well that after 20 years of propaganda in Russia, the people there have been completely brainwashed. But there is still a group of intelligent people who can think critically. Russian citizens fleeing from Russia's occupation policies by calling the surrender line called I Want to Live are the most concrete examples of this situation. Meanwhile, Ukraine developed new strategies and demonstrated remarkable ingenuity to persuade Russian soldiers to surrender. Konstantin Melnikov, a war correspondent who is often on the front lines, explained that the Ukrainian military designs its own unique advertising campaigns. In this campaign, Melnikov noted Ukrainian troops printed special leaflets, loading them into shells, and fired them into the Russian-occupied territory with a Grad rocket launcher. The leaflets state in Russian that the Russians should surrender voluntarily, and they give accurate statistics of the Ukrainian general staff on Russian casualties. In addition, the brochures prepared within the scope of the campaign include the phone numbers that those who want to surrender can call. The most striking detail in the brochures was a price list showing how much money Russian soldiers can earn if they surrendered with their equipment. According to the price list prepared by the Ukrainians, Russian soldiers who deliver a tank can receive a total payment of $10,000. Also, alongside these campaigns in the expansion of the I Want to Live project, in December, a training video was released explaining to prospective Russian POWs how to surrender not only directly to the Ukrainian authorities, but also to a drone. Analysts predict that more and more Russians will surrender, noting that Ukraine, unlike Russia, 
complies with the Geneva Conventions as well as such campaigns and practices when it comes to respecting the rights of prisoners of war. Ukrainian Ombudsman Mitro Loibnitz confirmed that a monitoring mission carried out on March 28 is one of the camps where Russian prisoners are held, has met international standards for the treatment of prisoners. Loibnitz and his team carried out this critical task. Loibnitz found on his Telegram channel that Russian prisoners of war are being held in accordance with the requirements of the Geneva Convention on the Treatment of Prisoners of War. According to the observations of Loibnitz and his team, the temperature conditions and daily routine at the facilities met all the requirements of the contract. In addition, surrendering Russian soldiers have the right to communicate and work with their relatives in turn through periodic telephone calls. According to the requirements of the Geneva Convention, the surrendered here are fed a military menu. In addition, human rights and social activist Tatiana Ivanovo emphasized that when the Russians were taken prisoner in the caravan Sarai, they saw that the conditions of captivity were not humiliating. Considering all of this, Ukraine was proving to the whole world how conscientious and humane it approached the prisoners of war. The surrendered Russians are, of course, in detention. Of course, they are in detention centers. But according to the agreement implemented by the Ukrainians, these people are kept separate from the criminals. They were not kept in the same cells as the criminals. These people say that they are ready to work on the construction sites here and repair what they have destroyed. In short, Russian soldiers and citizens who surrendered to the Ukrainian armed forces never want to return to Russia. They don't want to go back because they know what awaits them at home. So how did I want to live? Presented by Ukraine, which is a completely new hope of life for Russians begin. The project was created to provide Russian and Belarusian military personnel to escape the war in Ukraine. I wanted to live. Spokesman Vitaly Matvienko stated that they officially launched the surrender line on September 18, 2022, a few days before Russian President Vladimir Putin announced the start of the mobilization. The hotline, which was initially supervised by the National Police of Ukraine, was later transferred to Kuzabov. The surrender line I want to live, which has become almost corporate, is now operated around the clock by operators who answer calls and process messages from various messaging applications. Matt Vienko noted that in addition to investigations from active soldiers, the initiative has received numerous calls from Russian civilians who fear that they will be enlisted soon. The increase in surrender numbers was mainly due to fears of a counterattack expected this spring from Ukraine. In fact, the vast majority of Russians did not want to fight. They wanted to save their own lives by surrendering. This is a good alternative because the days ahead are not looking good for Russia. The approach of the Moscow administration towards its capitulating citizens is much more hopeless than the possible future situation of Russia. In a preemptive move to intimidate asylum seekers, Russia's Supreme Court ruled last week that Russian soldiers could be sentenced to up to 10 years in prison for voluntarily surrendering. Here is a short and clear summary of the value Russia attaches to its citizens and soldiers. This is the most visible proof that free will no longer exist in Russia. But freedom is such an important phenomenon that the Russians, who want to live free despite the threats of the Putin regime and surrender to Kiev, respect the freedom of the Ukrainians in the same way. A ceasefire on the Russian and Ukrainian fronts does not seem possible at the moment. Russia, which has one of the most powerful armies in the world and has been touted as a superpower for years cannot get out of the swamp in Ukraine. Russia's war was shattered by hit-and-run attacks by Ukrainians armed with modern anti-tank missiles after Ukraine repelled the first attack and the occupation turned into a war of attrition. We can say that what happened is no longer a simple war between Russia and Ukraine. Despite all the difficulties, Ukraine has been behind Russia in almost every aspect, such as the number of tanks, soldiers and planes. But thanks to the support of Western countries, the USA and NATO, they have achieved great success against Russia. While the Ukrainian forces outperform the Russian invaders in the war and prove themselves to the whole world, they also proved that they can win this war. In short, Ukraine's ability to make an unexpected surprise to Russia mark this war. The Ukrainian forces dealt a serious blow to Moscow's military objectives, with their attacks targeting the reinforcement route arsenals and command centers to stay at the front, let alone the advance of Russia. Ukraine has given a clear message to the world that it can really win the war. The significant gains that Ukraine has made in the field have also shown its ability to overcome in shortcomings by creating more demand for weapons.
As such, the uninterrupted Western aid and determination to reclaim Ukraine's lands exhausted the Russian troops in this war. Crimea, the most critical corner of the war at the moment, becoming more important day by day after the heavy attacks of the Ukrainian armed forces on the Russian army. A memorable report was published in Crimea. According to the intelligence officials in the region, Russian troops began to surrender in groups. In the published reports, it was stated that the surrendered Russian soldiers surrendered while waving the white flag and without equipment. On the other hand, the Ukrainian forces, which completed its preparations against the possible Russian attacks, expected the spring, prepared a surprise for Russian President Putin before the attack. Ukraine continues to block Russia's paths. The other day, Ukrainian forces launched a striking attack on Russian factory that produces pots of the Crimean Bridge. Months after the Kerch Strait Bridge attack, it was target of a covered attack by Kiev troops suspected of targeting the facility in a border city. A major factory in Russia reportedly involved in rebuilding bridge in Crimea was engulfed in flames after a covered missile attack that Ukraine suspected had crossed the border. Local media reported that the factory in the Borovsky district of the Belgorod region produced his spare pots of bridges and is expected to help rebuild the Kerch Strait Bridge, which was badly damaged in the Ukrainian attack last year. Videos posted on social media by local residents showed a flame rising above the horizon, visible from several kilometers away, lighting up the Predane sky. Belgorod region Governor Ivan Cheslov Gladkov said in a statement that the fires caused by the Ukrainian airstrike was under control and firefighters were doing their best to minimize the damage. He, Vojislav Gladkov, added that this attack did not cause any casualties and the target of the attack was not specified. Mr. Gladkov stated that he would ask Vladimir Putin to raise terrorist threat level in the region to an unspecified yellow due to the recent attack. Belgorod, 200 kilometers north of Warkiv, has been a temporary yellow threat level since Ukraine's attacks on the border city began last year, and authorities have since handed it over. The need for an extension of the yellow terrorist threat clearance is absolutely clear. The restrictions are expected to be lifted as soon as the situation improves. The safety of Belgorod residents is considered the most important thing at the moment by the Russian authorities. The yellow threat level means a tangible risk of attack, requiring citizens to avoid public places and giving authorities broader powers. On the other hand, the fire at the Belgorod power plant a few days ago is a great embarrassment for the Kremlin. As earlier this week, the Russian president openly urged the Russian military to eliminate the possibility of attacking border areas such as Belgorod. Putin also instructed the government to allocate extra funds to deal with the aftermath of the spillover attacks in Ukraine. Since the start of the invasion of Ukraine last year, stray shells have been falling on villages. Is on the Russian side of the border, causing damage and occasionally injuring people. According to the latest figures from the Russian official media outlet, at least 36 people have been killed and 132 injured in the Russian border area since the start of the war. Most of the victims came from the Belgorod region. On the other hand, Ukraine is carrying out attacks on Russia's supply lines, which provide billions of euros worth of weapons and ammunition, including rail lines and storage. Kiev has not been able to gain upper hand against Russia in its struggle to shape the conditions of the war in Ukraine. The rapid and growing flow of arms supplied by Ukraine's Western backers has become the most vital focus for Russia. In response, Russia is pushing to take the Ukrainian town near a vital supply line. Moscow, on the other hand, is deploying thousands of troops to southeastern Ukraine as it renews its offensive on a strategically important city that Ukrainian forces are using to harass shipments on a critical Russian supply line stretching from the eastern Donbass region to Crimea. Russia, which is constantly preparing for the eastern front lines of Ukraine, has been attracting a lot of attention recently. The town of Volodar has been on Russia's target for a long time. It is located at the intersection of the Eastern Front in the Donetsk region and the Southern Front of the Zaporizhia region, close to the only railway line connecting Crimea with the Donbass region. The Ukrainians used this proximity to launch artillery shells at trains, which limited Russia's ability to transport men and equipment between the two fronts after a major advance was reported to have failed and massive casualties were reported in November. Russian commanders are once again focused on Volodar and its environs in hopes of securing the rail line. 
Russia wants to capture the small and insignificant town and have the ability to quickly and massively transfer troops from one direction to another with a wide logistical artery along the entire front line. On the other hand, Ukrainian President Zelensky in his last speech stated that the situation may be serious as Russia sends more and more forces to break through the defense. In addition to taking control of the Donbass, Moscow intends to retain control of the so-called land bridge, the occupied piece of land that connects Russia to the peninsula, Crimea, which it has occupied since 2014. Kiev's control over Volodar threatens him, too. Ukrainian officials said they had repelled recent attacks, but warned that Russian forces, backed by thousands of newly mobilized soldiers, were trying to encircle the town. The city's deputy mayor, Maxim Hrabovsky, told the Ukrainian news outlet that the Russians are not trying to break through Hulda's defenses. They are trying to besiege the city from both sides. He noted that they managed to advance some nearby villages, but the Ukrainian army pushed them back to their previous positions. While the clashes continue on the eastern front and around the embattled city of Bahmut, about 100 kilometers from Volodar, the damage caused by Russia's attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure is being tried to be repaired. At this point, the war between Russia and Ukraine seems to be prolonged in the next period. Victory for Russia will hardly be possible. The Ukrainian army quickly entered the NATO system and the scope of the Western tactical and military concept. Ukraine has entered NATO, albeit indirectly. The US and NATO's policy of framing Russia and Russia's opposition to it and the dangerous competition in the framework of the missile defense system may trigger the withdrawal of both sides from the IAF convention the Nuclear Weapons and Delivery Vehicle Limitation Treaty. Increasing work on weapons systems prohibited by this convention may drag the region into a dangerous process, both offensive and defensive arms race, a process in which the size of the conflicts will become more and more intense has begun to be answered. While the war between Russia and Ukraine continues at full speed, it seems that new borders of the region will be drawn in the future. The Ukraine-Russia war has displaced the international status quo with its global effects. First of all, countries with permanent neutrality status have broken their silence in the Russia-Ukraine war. Especially these days, Sweden, one of the neutral countries, changed its diplomatic strategy with its harsh statements against Russia in the Russia-Ukraine war and with weapons aid to Ukraine. Neutral countries which could no longer remain silent on the attack on Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty openly sided with Ukraine despite its permanent neutrality status. In addition, countries that host neutrality and peace talks in the international arena joined the list of countries that decided to impose sanctions against Russia. Sweden managed to shake the balance again by announcing a new military aid package to the Ukrainian army. Swedish Foreign Minister Ann Lind announced that her country will send 5,000 anti-tank guns, 5,000 helmets, 5,000 body shields, and 135,000 groceries to Ukraine in military aid, as well as $47 million in funds to the Ukrainian army. To date, Sweden has sent eight more military aid packages to Ukraine, the largest of which totaled $287 million sent in November. According to Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson, while details on the military aid packages were limited, Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov stated that the packages included air defense systems, ammunition and vehicles and personal equipment, especially for the winter months. Sweden's new military aid package included air defense systems, spring munitions and a special aid package to assist the country's spring offensive. In addition, Lt. Col. Peter Leiden from the Swedish Defense Academy announced that the Swedish Ministry of Defense has submitted a report that they can supply Ukraine with 48 Archer and 12 155mm wheeled self-propelled howitzers. The decision to send the longest-range self-propelled guns Archer to Ukraine by Sweden shook the world's agenda deeply. The effects of this shockade movement were felt most in Moscow at the moment, especially when Ukraine's eastern front lines are quite complicated. The Archer's arrival in Ukraine greatly increased the final gains of the Ukrainian army, both in the Donetsk region and in Luhansk. Sweden's Archers, which are used extensively in the Barmut front line these days, doubled the pressure on the Russian forces because, as we mentioned, the ongoing front line clashes in Bahamut and other regions of Donetsk. The use of self-propelled guns with the longest range in the Ukrainian army has changed the course in these regions. But if you noticed, with Archer and other Swedish military ammunition reaching the Ukrainian army, 
Kiev took control of an important city like Volodar, and Bonmut started to concentrate much more on the front line. In fact, it is of vital importance to provide this military support to the Ukrainians, who are much more active in the Luhansk region. Featuring a critical game changer, Archer is an 8x8 truck mounted 155mm squared self propelled howitzer, jointly developed and manufactured by Swedish company Bofors and Bay Systems. The original version of the Archer is based on a modified Volvo construction equipment A30 articulated dump truck. But this equipment can also be used on other truck chassis such as the Man 8x8. Archer is armed with a 155mm squared 52 caliber gun combined with 21 rounds and an 81 charge automatic loading system. Magazines handle all types of 155mm squared artillery munitions, including advanced sensor fused and precision guided munitions. Depending on customer requirements, the loading magazine can be adapted to conventional bags or modular systems. Fire abilities in Archer include direct fire and multiple projectile simultaneous strikes. In addition, the maximum firing range of this striking gun is 40 km with conventional 155mm squared ammunition and 60 km with precision guided ammunition, including Excalibur. The Archer's crew cabin is protected against nuclear, biological, and chemical threats, artillery fragmentation, mine attack, and excessive explosion pressure. Significant crew separation from weapons and ammo further increases survivability. These guns are mounted on a commercial articulated vehicle specially developed for high mobility in the toughest terrain. It can operate at a maximum road speed of 70 km, with a maximum cruising range of 1,000 km. The artillery system is supported by an ordnance supply vehicle designed to allow the howitzer to be fully reloaded in minutes. In addition, Sweden has already supplied Ukraine with 84 light anti-tank guns and Robot-17 anti-ship missiles. The fact that Sweden does not leave Ukraine alone and has a border with Russia puts them in an important position both in terms of the ongoing war and in suppressing Russian imperialism. In addition, progress has been made in equipping two tank battalions for Ukraine by European partners. Sweden wants to participate with 10 Leopard tanks. Prime Minister Ulf Christensen and Defense Minister Paul Johnson presented a new military support package to Ukraine. Sweden joins the European support for Ukraine with its Leopard 2 tanks. In addition, Sweden wants to provide a total of 10 Type 2A6 and 2A5 Leopard tanks for the planned equipment of the two Ukrainian tank battalions announced by Germany. Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Christensen confirmed the news with a statement. On the other hand, the Ukrainian army is mastering German-made armored vehicles such as the Leopard tanks or the Martyr 1A3 infantry fighting vehicles. Training of the Ukrainian crew continues at the training grounds in Munster. The Ukrainian crew made the first shot with the Leopard 2A6 tank during training at the military training ground. It was recorded that the video released by Ukrainian diplomat and Ukraine's ambassador to Germany, Alexei Makiev, was taken from the German Fox armored personnel carrier. The Leopard 2 main battle tank, training of the Ukrainian crew in Germany, which was launched on February 13, is scheduled to be completed shortly. Because the Leopard tanks will be delivered to the Ukrainian armed forces as soon as possible. Leopard 2 training takes about six weeks. This applies to both tank crew and maintenance personnel. Soldiers trained first in the simulator, then in field conditions. The final phase of the training program concludes in the form of fire training which includes shooting from a tank. The main planned goal is to deliver a strong and well-fortified unit to the armed forces of Ukraine. At the end of the training, it is aimed that the soldiers will have enough knowledge of the weapon system to be able to fight both day and night. In addition, it is extremely important for Ukraine that Russia does not gain air dominance. To ensure this, in the long run, Ukraine needs an air defense system. Sweden will strengthen Ukraine's air defense with Iris and Hawk systems. At this point, Sweden, in coordination with its partners, decided to deliver the MiM-23 Hawk air defense systems and the German anti-aircraft missile system. As Ukraine emphasized in its demands, the government plans to provide defense equipment free of charge as part of the new support package, which is being organized for the 11th consecutive year. Sweden is trying to contribute so that Russian aviation does not gain an advantage in the air. Iris. One of the world's newest developments in the field of air defense will significantly strengthen the capabilities of the Ukrainian air defense.
There will be more and more air defense systems, and eventually they will completely replace the old fleet of Soviet equipment. Ukraine, therefore, needs motivated defenders in the Air Force who can master these weapons and defend the country. Accordingly, the Ukrainian Air Force announced the recruitment of cadets for the training of Iris NASM's Patriot empty anti aircraft missile systems. Currently, the military academy is scattered all over Ukraine, but training takes place both in Ukraine and abroad. Military personnel and teachers undergo appropriate training in the operation and use of modern anti-aircraft missile systems in many European countries and the USA. However, the time when specialists in managing complex air defense systems will be trained in Ukraine does not seem far official. On the other hand, contrary to what Russia believes that Western democracy will lose, Europe is fighting for Ukraine more than ever in an effort to become one. After all, there was an understanding that dominated Europe since the end of the Second World War and even the end of the Cold War. Continental Europe would solve all its problems through diplomacy, even in the most difficult conditions, the table would not be scattered, and very important problems would be solved with economic sanctions and similar means. While this perfectly reasonable approach is facing perhaps one of its deepest tests, Europe will also show whether it can overcome this ordeal with the Ukraine war. Although it seems that there is Russia on one end of the rope and Ukraine on the other, these two countries are not the only ones that maintain the balances. The fact that Ukraine is seen as an unfinished business by Putin, we clearly see that Russia's main purpose in continuing the war by continuing to follow a strategy of deterrence or escalating the current situation is to make NATO and the USA accept their red lines. Despite all this, the first invasion plan, which Russia had to withdraw several times, clearly failed. But we can see that the war is not over yet. We can say that this war has also turned into a protracted war in which Western leaders are determined that Ukraine will win. Thus, the realistic expectation of neutrality for Ukraine has long since disappeared. What was intended to be a quick operation is now that the territory of Ukraine is independent and free. As a result, Russia has become a weaker country than a year ago. The Kiev administration, which Putin has aimed to overthrow, and President Zelensky in particular, on the contrary, became very strong. Russian President Vladimir Putin's plans for Ukraine did not work. In short, alarm bells began to ring for Putin.